This is fun. This is fun. Hi. Thanks for bringing the sun with you, Sarah. Before we chat, would you read just a little bit from your book? Happy to. It's such a beautiful fall day and it's about to get really heavy. I apologize in advance. <laughs> Grandpa Arnie loved working the land, not for the price of wheat per bushel, but because smelling damp earth at sunrise felt like a holy experience. Dad loved building something beautiful out of good lumber, not for the paycheck, but for seeing his own creativity turned into a sturdy, useful structure. The pleasure mom got when she sold a little working class house in Wichita wasn't just for the small commission, but for the tears in the family's eyes when she handed them the keys. Work can be a true communion with resources, materials, other people. I have no issue with work. It's relationship to the economy. Whose work is assigned what value is where the trouble comes in. My family's labor was undervalued to such an extent that while we never starved or went without shelter in a chronic way, we all knew what it felt like to need something essential. Food, shoes, a safe place to live, a rent payment, a trip to the doctor, and go without it for lack of money. That's the sort of mess that I wanted out of. Sarah, I wanted to start by talking to you about three words in the title of your book. You address the fourth one, work. Heartland. What is the heartland? Where is the heartland? Mm. You know, I think this might be the first time I've been asked this on stage, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to reflect on uh, the titling of the book, which, as you might imagine, isn't a willy-nilly affair. Um, a great deal of thought went into it, and I, I knew that this word is quite convoluted. Um, it's even been weaponized in some senses, commercialized. In this part, uh, here in these parts, you might see the same thing that I do in Kansas. About one out of every five um, businesses has the word heartland in it somewhere. Um, it's also been politicized to some extent, um, vaguely suggesting a certain kind of politics in, in more recent uh, political times. And so w what I was interested in doing what I've been doing for a long time as a journalist, and what I hope that this book does in a larger way, is um, uh, facilitate a conversation about an area, a place, a people, a region, a concept that has been reduced largely in our national discourse to a one-dimensional thing, often a negative thing, sometimes a sentimentalized thing. Heartland um, is and has, you know, um, uh, been all of those. And so, so for me, what heartland means is, is a little bit more metaphorical than the sense of a geographic region. The reason that I felt like it related to my book is I'm talking about um, the, the, the people who, who make this country hum, who, who fix its engines and, and plant its wheat and um, serve its food and repair its airplanes. Um, a, an experience on the ground that, that is very tactile, sometimes literally of the earth, um, that also has been um, uh, overlooked as, as an experience in this country, uh, even paradoxically while it is at the heart of its um, kind of infrastructure and, and general functioning. So that's a, a long <laughs> and convoluted way of saying that, that I understand that Heartland means different things to everyone and that what I was hoping to do with that title is allow you as the reader to bring that existing definition to the book and then the stories that I tell will either challenge um, some of those uh, concepts or, or reinforce them. Second word I want to ask about. You use the word broke rather than poor. Tell me about that choice, and what does broke connote that poor doesn't get at? Sure. Well, there are a few things. One, I've had the great fortune over the last year of have, being interviewed many times and having headlines written about me on the book, and often the, it'll look something like, she grew up dirt poor in Kansas, and it feels, it, it doesn't... Um, 
It's a surreal experience in that while it is true by every economic measure, when I was growing up, and I say as much in the book, we never in a million years would have used that word about ourselves. We had enough to eat, as indicated in the passage I just read, we had a roof over our heads. We might have had to shake the change out of the sofa cushions, but somehow we had enough money to usually put gas in the tank to get to work or school or whatever. And so by our estimation, that, that wasn't poor. Um, you know, class is a very relative experience and the way that we talk about it in this country, our, our vocabulary tends to be sort of lacking and poor is one of the words that I, that I don't care much for. I do use it throughout the book in various ways just because it is sort of our agreed upon language and vocabulary to, to represent a particular thing. But um, if you think about the, the, the language that we use to signal who um, resides at what rung in our socioeconomic ladder, well, even that metaphor of the ladder indicates a lower place and a higher place. And somewhere deep in our conscience, so too, hell is low and heaven is high. And the, the word poor actually means, the word poor literally means bad. Poor health, poor environment. Um, it's, and, and we use that same descriptor about an entire group of people based on uh, their econo economic station. So it, it was a quite intentional, I appreciate your, your noticing that. Broke, however, is a word we used about ourselves all the time, <laughs> and it was true. Third word I want to ask about is memoir. Now, on some level, this is a memoir. It's a story of you, you know, a fifth generation Kansas farm girl. But I think of it more as a socio-memoir or a memoir with a social mission. So just talk to me about where memoir meets social mission in this book before we get to some of the particulars in it. Sure, yeah. So I actually, in the long, many years process of crafting this book, I, I myself did not conceive of it as a memoir proper. It does have long, very personal passages that certainly qualify um, for in the purest term, uh, sense of that term. But the bigger picture of the book involves uh, research, social analysis, cultural critique, and also, perhaps most importantly, in terms of the, the construction of the narrative, um, deep family research across generations. So whereas memoir, that's, it's the French word for memory, and so it's in the nonfiction section because it, so long as you have an author who is being true with, um, uh, with memory, what you remember is not, of course, the, the objective facts of what happened. There is a fallibility and a subjectivity to the experience of memoir. And, and you work within those constraints so long as you aren't overtly intentionally making anything up. It's a true representation of your memoir, uh, mem memory, hence nonfiction. Uh, I'm also a journalist who's also always been interested in and, and conducted uh, research and, and believes that objective facts also have something to offer us. And so I wove those in wherever possible by way of historical statistics and also, um, as mentioned, a, a deep dive into my own family history and a kind of archival research to piece together who was where when. Uh, poverty tends to be uh, quite chaotic and transient and that means that just the records of our lives sometimes or lost along the way. So just piecing together the, the actual story of my family was part of that. But then interviewing my close family members for many years to put together the book is one of the reasons why it, um, memoir doesn't necessarily signal that about the book, but you will find that it's, it's not just my story, the traditional notion of a memoir of my coming of age or my memoir of XYZ experience. Um, there are a lot of passages that are constructed from the memories of my family members, uh, along with the research that I did about the moments in which they were situated in history. So I do hope that um, ultimately what the reader experiences is a much bigger, representation of, of truth with a little T and also a capital T than what my little life could have ever conveyed if I'd focused only on myself. So let's just bring it down to the story without the big sociological context for a moment. This is very much a story about women, not just about women, but about generations of women who grew up broke, who had babies very young, 
your mother was still in, in her late teens, right? Mm-hmm. When, when she had you. Um, let's start by talking about your grandma, Betty, who is in very many ways the hero of this book. Tell us about Grandma Betty. Oh, gosh. Where to begin? I, I always... Um envisioned her as kind of the star of the book and in many ways she's sort of the star of our family so that just makes sense you know if you were to kind of reduce her to a type or a an an archetype she's sort of the classic midwestern broad with a cigarette who's seen it all she waited the tables in the diner in the 60s she survived abusive marriages Um, as a woman she came through decades when women had even fewer protections than they do now in in places like work and home Um, and uh, and yet she has always been the most loving and generous um, you know tough but but not embittered person and the way that that has translated in our family and the way it was a great gift to me as a child is, as often happens in poor families where teen pregnancy is involved, the grandmother comes in as a sort of second mom. So she was all of 34 years old when she found out she was going to be a grandmother to me. And so um, so, for, so her presence and the fact that by that age she had sort of achieved a semblance of stability. She'd married a farmer. Her life had settled down. She was married, um, what, seven times? Uh, that's right, yeah. The man that I, <laughs> the man that I knew as my grandpa was, was her seventh husband. And she, she was with him for, for several decades and, until he died. And so it was sort of a different season of her life was beginning when I came along. And, um, but much of the book really documents her life bef- even before that. Her role in my life was very much as a stabilizing force and a force and you of... Li- you lived with her for quite a while, right? I did. I moved in permanently with her when I was 11 years old. So you were recently featured in a Dolly Parton podcast. Has anybody heard this? The Dolly Parton's America podcast. It's great. It features Sarah. And we get to hear from Grandma Betty in in this podcast. And one of the things that you talk to her about is the word feminism. Because Dolly Parton initially rejects the word feminism, and so does your Grandma Betty. And yet. So where does she stand on, on the idea of feminism? Yeah, so as, as someone who thinks and writes a lot about class um, and, and is also, you know, my prof- the tools of our trade is words, language. So I, I consider the ways in which the labels and the language and the words and the vocabularies that we have, sometimes um, we, we do not share this, a set of definitions across lines of class or race or gender and so on. And, and in this case, you know, I, I was the first person from my family to have the privilege of uh, going to college and, and having my mind expanded in those sorts of ways. So I've been exposed to what we might call feminist theory. Um, and usually that's the language that dominates feminist discourse. Is, is, it can be a very exclusive set of words that people like my grandma never had occasion to access. And yet, what I noticed over the years of sort of finding a... Um, pockets of hypocrisy within that um, more privileged world is there, there can be women and men who embody the tenets of feminism um, while simultaneously being suspicious perhaps of the term because uh, it's been weaponized in such a way that they have uh, picked up on some kind of neg- negative connotation from their own information sources. And so they might be reluctant to use the term and yet meanwhile are living feminism in a very brave way. So too, on the other side of that coin, someone who proudly broadcasts it on a t-shirt might fall short um, in the feminist charge. And so that's something that I wrote at length about how Dolly Parton in my mind is sort of represents that conundrum or that um, murky um, way that we consider feminism and so too does my grandma. You know, of, of the many details about your grandma in the book, one that I love is that she says she wants to be buried without her bra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, even though your, your grandma is, you know, as you say, the, the star of the book in many ways, you also write a lot about your mother um, in, a, in a somewhat different tone, but you dedicate the book to your mom. So talk to us about your mother who came through this broke rural life at a different time from your grandma. 
Yeah. So my mother, as was mentioned, she was 17 when she got pregnant with me. And so she was pretty much a child herself when she was um, first making a go as a mother and just, you know, very freshly wounded herself in in terms of what she survived in in poverty. And um, that let's say it was uh, the man I knew as my grandfather was Betty's seventh husband, and so my mom was a little kid when she was moving through the, that chaotic um, life of many houses, many husbands, and, and a lot of that, by the way, was driven by, it was a different time for women, um, not that these woes don't still exist, but um, essentially, their, Betty was married to a string of very uh, viciously violent men, uh, which is what she had learned in her own home, her, that her father modeled. And then when when she would always find um, uh, against the conventions of the time, uh, managed to in, insist on leaving that that marriage or that household, and then emerge into you know the poverty of not having any economic stability for herself as a woman, which um, you know public policy didn't help at the time. And then you know she lost custody of a son and the courts would say you've got to um you've got to show that you have a stable household if you want custody of him again so she'd get married to show a judge that she had a husband so it's it's not just that she was you know living wild and free although that was true too it was a very you know it was was complicated factors and my mother you know was an innocent child along the way and so she um uh, she had a hard time as a young mom out in a rural area. She was also, um, you know, a, a brilliant young woman who, with a lot of the same sort of creative inclinations that I have, kind of a natural wordsmith. She would write stories in notebooks and never show them to anyone. And so, what all the frustrations of being a woman in that situation? This was before. I and my brother came along before the Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, there are a lot of ways in which I think she probably felt sort of imprisoned in her house in the 1980s in a very similar way that women in the 1950s or before had. And I, and I saw that frustration in her, and it's something that I tried to not sugarcoat in the book because I think it's important for us to understand about women from all places, but in particular rural, um, there's a geographic isolation that comes along with the other forms of isolation that can be particularly dangerous for women. How do you think your mother's struggles, the isolation that she, isolation and frustration that she lived through, how did that travel down to you? How have you had to work through that? Well, I think the way that I worked through it was I wrote this book. Um, <laughs> And that's one of the reasons that it's dedicated to her, because um, most of this book, it, it, this context would be important for understanding this answer. Um, I knew that I was going to write this, but I couldn't have articulated exactly what it would be about. But when I was like eight years old, I was saying to my grandma, Betty, I'm going to write a book about you someday. And I got my first research grant to start the proper project um, when I was a senior in college in like 2001. And most of this book was written by the by 2005, when I was in my mid-20s. And um, years later, when I finally was able to get a book deal, I layered in a, a different sort of awareness after, you know, working as a journalist for, for more years and so on. But, but the reason it's important to understand that is much of this, and in particular, the personal passages were written in my 20s, and I think that that's the, that's the decade when all of us um, are sort of reckoning with whatever we were handed by our families. And you move through it however you do. Perhaps it's by partying, or perhaps it's, in, in my case, it was through a creative pursuit. And what happened along the way is that I came to, I had no choice. If I was going to tell the whole story, um, you know, it, 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 I suppose, you know, when I was um, a first generation college student at KU, I was presenting as a very proud, confident kid, but I was also carrying shame and anger and pain. And um, the thing about researching my family back as far back as records were kept and realizing things like, oh, I'm the first woman in my direct maternal line to not have a baby as a teenager. Oh, I'm the first person from my family to have the privilege of being in a, a, a safe intellectual space like this college campus. Working very hard along the way, but, um, you know, l- understanding deeply what my mom had survived, what her mom had survived, 
what her mom had survived forced a humility in me and sort of broke me of any claim that I would have on feeling sorry for myself. You know what I mean? So, um, so ultimately, while that was in service of the book, and I hope that it comes through in that regard, it also um, was, it's a bit of a cliche to refer to a creative project this way, but it was very much a personal catharsis too. You just used the word shame, and the word shame comes up in the book, the shame of poverty. It's a shame that you indicate you have felt and that other people who grow up poor, broke, disadvantaged somehow feel. Explain that shame to me. Shame for what? Mm. And in front of whom? Sure, yeah. You know, I think, um, as is often the case with emotions, I would never have been able to pinpoint the sense of um, unease that I felt on that college campus as shame at the time. I wouldn't have admitted it even to myself. But I can see in hindsight that, um, you know, around whom is, is an important question because I was essentially, while, you know, I, I ended up going to graduate school at an Ivy League university and that was an even greater lesson in um, class distinctions. But, but even at that fine state university, I was, truly seeing for the first time, you know, just a kid who got a car for high school graduation and the contrast of how hard I had worked to save up $3,000 for my beater car that got me from the farm to Lawrence or whatever. Um, being in classrooms where uh, professors would say things like, they would joke and say, I know that you don't want to do this homework assignment, but your parents are paying a lot of money for you to be here, so go home and do it. And, you know, I was paying my own way and I'd worked hard to get scholarships and I had three jobs to pay the bills and there was a sense, there was no word on campus for whatever it was that I represented at the time, which was first generation and low income. There was a very small space for that to even be acknowledged in, in academia at the time. And so all of those things felt like a sort of um, erasure of where I came from. Uh, and maybe even just a, a lack of awareness that it even existed. And that sense of invisibility, when, when, when who you are, where you come from, what you've done is not acknowledged by the person that's eating a sandwich between pieces of bread that came from wheat that you watched your family's fingers bleed growing and harvesting, is um, it signals to you you are not, you're not worth as much as the people in this room whose experiences are being validated in my language and by our popular culture and so on. And so that's where the sort of amorphous sense of shame came in, the way that it translated for me, and I think this is a pretty common psychological turn, is it, trend, it turned into a pride about where I came from. So, so I could sense that the shame was being put on me, and it, but it, it, didn't, it, it didn't preclude me from knocking on particular doors. But, but when I did it, you know, I'd be shaking and scared knowing that I wasn't supposed to knock on that door for that internship or that job or whatever. Um, so it, it, it can kind of cling to you, um, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to shape your, your behaviors. It's a point in the book you mentioned that you, you didn't even have a term for working class until much later in life. So at what point did, did this notion of class reveal itself to you? I have tried to recall the first time I even encountered the concept, and I think it was probably in... Um, like an English class in high school, I read a British novel from the 19th century, and it was referring, and that class tends to be loom large in, in British literature in a, in a pretty overt way. But it was, um, it still, f I didn't quite even understand ultimately. You know, I could see that the protagonist felt, you know, her dress wasn't as pretty as the girls from. Um, better houses or whatever. But I still didn't have, I, I, I wasn't making the connection that there was something within our society that might be a parallel of sorts. Um, and then, we, you know, when I was at KU, I took a couple of classes that really exposed me to the idea in this country. I had an American literature course where we were reading sort of early 20th century, uh, really socialist literature, basically. 
Um, that, but, but even after graduating from college, there were years where I wasn't, I, I didn't have that direct sort of lens on the world. Um, I think that ultimately what happened is I, along with whatever sort of collective consciousness we share here in this country, we have all been moving into a heightened awareness of what ultimately we know now today as historic wealth inequality. So I was a child in the 80s during the farm crisis when, um, you know, 80 years of quote unquote rural flight um, after following the industrial revolution was coming to a head in the form of farms around me foreclosing and small town businesses shuttering. So I was growing up in a place that was being referred to as dying. Um, then in my, you know, I was an adolescent and coming of age in the 90s when we were supposedly, as my family would say, high on the hog. You know, all the economic measures were claiming that everybody was doing great, but I could see that my family was struggling. They don't own stocks. The stock market doesn't say anything about what's going on with them. So so it, it was a slow kind of um, kind of sunrise of awareness of, oh, the reason that I haven't had this language is that we have been willfully denying and obscuring it as a society and a country that has claimed for centuries to be a pure democracy in which if you work hard, your outcomes should bear fruit. Well, everyone in this room knows people, and maybe it's yourself, who has worked really hard and perhaps not for just rewards. And so finding the language to talk about that really was happened in real time of the creation of this book. I have a question for the audience. How many of you grew up what you would call working class? How many of you would call yourself working class today? I don't know what to deduce from that, but I'm just, I'm <laughs> but I'm interested. One of the things that you're careful to do in your book, Sarah, is to, with some frequency, point out that even though we, we tend to equate class, when we think of working class, we think of white working class. I mean, not necessarily that we all think that, but that's the term, right? A white working class. But, but you go out of your way to, to point out that these issues of class, issues of poverty, um, are, are, are just embedded in our society in, in ways that are also entangled with race. And that it plays out in some similar ways for people of, who are not white, but also in different ways. So talk to us about, about your thought process there and, and what you see as the distinction and also addressing it in this book, knowing that you had to address it. Yeah. Um, I knew that I wanted to and must, you know, address other aspects of identity because class intertwines with, in academic terms we would say intersects with all of them. Um, and, you know, as uh, benefiting from whiteness would mean that I could write a book about class and maybe not be taken to task if I didn't talk about race. But the thing about any power structure in this country, whether it's race or class or gender, well, not just this country, but the world, historically, whoever's on the losing end of a kind of continuum of power is the one who has to stand up and fight for justice. So women perhaps more so than men over the years have called attention to gender inequities. It unfortunately has fallen on the shoulders of people of color to raise awareness about racism. And so too in economic matters, people who have lived uh, poverty or working poverty firsthand are, are the ones that tend to bring that consciousness to conversation. So, you know, I think that any time that we can um, break that uh, mold by but bearing witness to our privileges simultaneous to our disadvantages, um, we do a service for the greater good. And so that, that was my um, kind of mission statement as far as how I handled it. The way that I um, uh, conceive of the intertwining of my race and class, the white working class, is it's a simultaneous racial privilege and economic disadvantage. And what we have um, failed to understand or discuss as a country for a long time, perhaps to our detriment, if you look at current political tides, is that those two things can happen simultaneously. Um, 
just in, in raw numbers, there are more white people in poverty than any other group. That's just by way of our population. Statistically speaking, however, your probabilities, you are more likely to be poor if you are a person of color uh, with some distinction among groups therein um, because of the various ways that our, we have a racist system at work in this country. So um, both of those things can, are true at the same time. And so um, the, the nuance that is required for that level of conversation, unfortunately, doesn't often make it to cable news discussions, <laughs> um, but it should, and it needs to if we're going to have constructive dialogue. Um, and, you know, I find that um, the, the, the lines that are, that are drawn about race to seemingly divide the working class or, or poor folks is, um, is often a construct of people in higher places. And what I mean by that is on the ground, um, you know, my dad has been a construction worker for decades. He's on a construction crew every day with a, people of different ethnicities and colors, and that doesn't mean that he or someone in his shoes can't be capable of racism. It doesn't mean that um, he isn't also benefiting from uh, white privilege in that moment. But I'm always suspicious of these messages that come from way up in the class strata that suggest that there is this, um, as though the, the white working class and people of color who are also in economic, um, enduring economic struggles are, are living separately and, and they're wagging their finger about that from lily white gentrified neighborhoods. You know what I mean? There's something in that that we need to talk about as relates to class in this country. You just mentioned your dad. Talk to us about him a little bit. Now, the men in your book, there are a lot of violent men in your book. The women in your book have been involved with a lot of violent men, so this theme of violence among men is significant and related to poverty. But you point out that you were lucky to get a kind dad. And you recently interviewed him in a podcast. I listened to it, another great podcast, listening to her dad talk. You can see where she got some of this, uh, this verbal skill. Um, just tell us about him. Sure, yeah, I, I, this is another one of those things I didn't realize until many years later, of course, and research and the understandings that come with adulthood. But, but yeah, I'm pretty much on, on my mom's side of the family, the, the only woman who had a father who was both, you know, m mostly present and also not violent. And so my, uh, my, my mom picked a good one while they were too young to get started in, in that sort of chapter of life, and they, they did divorce when I was a kid. Um, he, uh, and, and you know, he, after that divorce, was not as present in my life. I still saw him on the weekends. Um, he's not a perfect guy. He, over the years here and there, drank too much, gambled too much, but I always knew that he loved me. And he was always, um, speak, to go back to the ideas about feminism, he never probably would have used that word in a million years. Um, he might not have even been able to define it, but he embodied it in that he, um, he spoke to me, I, I hesitate to use this term because he was my father and therein is an appropriate sort of power structure of sorts, but he spoke to me like, like an equal. He was interested in what I had to say. Um, he encouraged, he didn't necessarily, none of my family really had any particular idea of what I should or could be, um, nor did they discourage me from being anything. What I sometimes say one of the blessings of coming from nothing is nobody expects nothing either. <laughs> And so I was free to kind of make my own path. That comes with challenges too. But my dad has just always been um, a very decent, good guy. A kind of, he has a sort of Zen quality about him. Really a philosopher at heart. He used to write little poems with his carpenter's pencil on scraps of two by fours from his job sites and share them with me and nobody else perhaps because you know, he, he looks, he's got a beard, he wears the hard hat, and you would think if you saw him based on our, the way that we conceive of that sort of man, um, that he was a particular type of dude. And actually his 
politics are extremely radically progressive, um, and his um, his support for me was was unwavering. I want to come back to politics in a minute and your own evolution and the evolution of the people in your family, but. One element of this book that, that I haven't seen written about a lot is the fact that you grew up not only broke and rural and Midwestern, but Catholic. Now that is a particular version of growing up broke and rural and Midwestern. So tell me how Catholicism has affected you. German Catholicism. Sure, yes. <laughs> I bet there's some people in this uh, Chicago area room that get that. Um, it's, yeah, you know, kind of all of the adjectives that you just used c connote or in general terms send, tend to come with a, a sort of stoicism about the culture. So to be German, Catholic, rural, Midwestern, working class is like, we weren't talking very much about things like feelings. <laughs> Discipline and alcohol. <laughs> there was a lot of alcohol and, um, and, and a, very, a very stern sense of love and a very quiet mode of being. And, and I think, how did that affect me? One is that, you know, while I, I did, full disclosure, leave the Catholic Church in my mid-20s and I'm now happily non-religious, I think that, that um, the, the silence that comes with that particular, at least our ver rural version of the faith, it was like a little clappered church on the prairie with the wind beaten against it and I had all my sacraments there, so too did my dad. Um, the communion rail was carved from an oak tree on my grandpa's land. Um, the men in my family repaired the steeple. It, it, was, um, it was a really profound experience, I think, you know, again, not understood as a child, but in hindsight, to sit in a structure where um, the, that particular faith worked well for us in that well, it was largely about a carpenter, and I was my dad was a carpenter. When I was a little kid, I used to, I, like when I was a little, little, I had this vague sense that my dad and Joseph were the same person. <laughs> <laughs> I was like three years old, like, wow, my dad's in the Bible, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> but so there was something, there's something about the, the, tac the tactile, very physical sense of that particular faith and religion that, that made sense for a working class people and, and the silence and the quiet that came with the way that we observed it was very good for the type of uh, personality or disposition that would end up becoming a writer. So it was a very reflective, pre-digital, pre-smartphones. We didn't even, we didn't have cable or air conditioning. It was a, it was a quiet place to be and that really behooved my own well, even just my own private sense of spirituality, which was perhaps related to, but also apart from that faith, which you know works in in my in my writing, I think, um, and um, and but but the the negative side of that, I would say, is um, that um, denomination of Christianity features, you know not a simplified cross at the front of the church, but a literal, a crucifix with a representation of the bleeding man hanging on it. And the sense of sacrifice um, that, um, and perhaps in its worst incarnations, guilt, that um, some of you know can be part of the Catholic experience or package, um, is something that I had to work through and I suppose for my own purposes get over. Um, in order to think that I had a right to or should do something so audacious as write a book coming from where I did. So it's a complicated one, as it always is. You just use a great phrase, a stern sense of love. I like that. Um, uh, this morning I was, I was making a, just a list of, of words that popped out at me in, in your book. Isolation transience, shame, which we've discussed, and belonging. I want to talk about the three we haven't discussed. Isolation, rural living, living in poverty, 
even if it's not rural, can create deep isolation. Talk about that. Yeah, that, that comes in, it, it's sort of multifaceted, that isolation. So the geographic aspect of it is just obvious. You know, there's um, a mile to your next neighbor and 15 miles to the closest grocery store. And in my case, it was like 40 miles to the closest um, city, being Wichita in my case. And there are versions of rural life that are much, 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 much more remote than that, and that would look on where my farm was situated as as um, real urban proximity. But um, so so there's the the geographic piece that just involves space and time. But then there's also the um, when you're when you're talking about the the impo impoverished or struggling version of rural, then as you said, is is true also for for urban people or suburban people. There are there are cultural ways in which the isolation ex is experienced or social and economic. So an example of that would just be, well, if you can't afford a ticket to an event um, or to any event, you're not going to go to, you're not going to experience the culture that you might be able to access otherwise. And, and that culture is usually in a shared space like this beautiful auditorium. Um, there's also a sense of, uh, you know, if you are shamed for your how you present physically maybe um uh, if your teeth grew in crooked and you weren't able to afford various sorts of uh, dentistry and you're um you you've only got one pair of jeans and it has stains all over it from work and um you don't own a suit you know there there are certain even a, pl even a place like a library, which is kind of like a pillar of democracy and is there for public access, there are people that I know and love who would be uncomfortable in that place because it's clean and shiny and full of books and run by people with college educations. So while that's not intended, it, perhaps, it's how it's experienced. So the isolation comes in many forms. Um, and I think for that reason, the richness that can come with that is we, we are a very tight family, very tight. And I think that that's true for a lot of people uh, who came up with limited means. You, you sort of turn inward to make your own fun. And we threw some pretty legendary parties when we couldn't afford to go to the show. <laughs> The word transience. You moved around a lot. You went to a lot of different schools. That's also true here in Chicago. I mean, people who don't have money in Chicago, they move around all the time. They wind up school to school to school. Let's talk about what that looked like in your life and, and the effect that that had on you. I'm sure it made you adaptable in certain mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, so for anyone who's confused about how that could be simultaneous with this farm upbringing, um, my mother's side of the family, they were a couple generations off the farm by the, by the time my mom was a teenager, and so they really thought of themselves as, as city people in Wichita, and poor folks, but moved around a lot. She met my dad, and he's sort of the farm kid that had always been in the same place, and that's why I had these sort of two worlds butting up against each other, and there, for a time, I was sort of moving with my mom, basically, through a lot of, and my dad, too, in, in our, my very early life, but I ended up situated on my grandparents' farm permanently when I was 11. So with that backstory um, covered, I went to, by the time I was in ninth grade, I'd gone to eight schools. And so how does that affect a kid? You know, it's incredibly, I, I have learned since that a, according to child psychologists, that's like the absolute worst um, thing that can befall a child is to have to change schools or, or environments. And to do it that many times is, is pretty um, intense, certainly. Um, I think the, the challenge of that was, um, well, I guess, I guess it kind of engendered an, another level of a sense of isolation. Because wherever I went, I, I wasn't there long enough to really... You know, I, I might make some friends. I was a pretty outgoing kid. I was sort of in different schools depending on the kind of vibe of the, my class. I either was or wasn't accepted. Um, and that was hard. The blessings that came with that, I suppose, are, like you said, an adaptability. But also, I think, I noticed how I knew I was the same person wherever I went. And yet, I was sort of given a different assignment socially in different schools. 
So in some schools, I was like one of the popular kids. And in some schools, I didn't have any friends and I spent every school recess alone on a swing set. And so I, it developed in me a, a, a sense of sort of character observation that I guess was good for a future writer in that um, I, I, could, I could sort of pinpoint at any given school certain like archetypes, you know, like among the quote unquote popular kids and the quote unquote troublemakers and so on. And, and I became, that sense of being on the outside, I suppose is what I'm saying, made me more of an observer. And that's an important, um, an important quality for a writer to have. Related word, belonging. So when you move around a lot, when you're dealing with isolation, you're also just, because it's human, you're fundamentally seeking belonging. So how as a kid did you find belonging and does that still play out in your life? You know, I think growing up, the defining sense or emotion isn't quite the right term, um, the defining conflict of my coming of age was, was a sense of loneliness. I felt and thought of myself as extremely alone in the world in a lot of ways, da deep down to the bone, for a lot of reasons. One, I had ideas and aspirations that were very, tended to be very different from the people that I loved the most and I was surrounded by, my own family. Um, all of the moving through schools that we've discussed, the uh, geographic isolation, which was also a beautiful thing, by the way, uh, more so a positive than a negative, actually, actually for me, as just a lover of nature, but, and also the kind of economic barriers that would keep a poor kid from accessing um, certain experiences. You know, I didn't, I didn't have piano lessons or swimming lessons. I didn't go to summer camp. Um, I worked during the summers when I was, you know, on the farm from kind of late childhood through my teens. And, and so, um, you know, belonging, I think that sense of a lack thereof, regardless of what space that I was in, because even to go back to my, my time at KU, which I think of as like the hardest years of my life, which is why I bring it up over and over. The reason it was the hardest, by the way, is that that was the bridge. That was the moment when I was doing something that nobody from where I came from had, and thus rendered me forever different from the place that I love and come from. While, you know, meanwhile, in that place, I'm also never truly among um, that place or class in, a, in the deepest sense of belonging in that I'm from a very different place than most of the people in, like say, a, 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 a newsroom that I share professionally or whatever. So what has um, ultimately somewhere a lot, you know, I think that that was a sort of painful experience when I was very young, but I came to understand it as a great gift and a privilege and that in a, something that allows me to be of service at this moment when we need people to be bridges in a, a polarized society. Um, the great uh, African-American thinker and writer W.E.B. Du Bois coined a term for that experience, which is double consciousness. Um, he was referring to his experience as being simultaneously an African-American man and also a very well-educated intellectual who was accepted in some very white circles. And those two things, of course, at that time were to be kept apart, and yet he was embodying both in his physical form and mind and spirit. And by the way, I'm not drawing any parallel <laughs> between my experience and his remotely, but what I'm saying is, um, ultimately what what felt sometimes like a lack of belonging in either place um, ultimately has proven for me more of a, a sense of an, an ability to facilitate conversations between two places. And that's where I find my belonging. Well, and that's so critical to what you're doing now. I mean, you, you know, you've written the memoir, you've added the sociology to it, but now you're using this book, using your life as a way to create these conversations, to help, to be the bridge, right? Um, and in the course of your life, your political views and the political views of most of your family have evolved, changed, whichever word you want to use. You once wore a button that said impeach Clinton. Your first vote was for George Bush, the younger. In 2000. 
Uh, so explain that political evolution, and we are almost out of time, and I want to, so this has to be like 30 seconds. This is, this is, <laughs> this is speed dating here easy, now. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so your question is how, how did that happen, sort of? Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah what, what changed? Yeah, what, make what changed? Change? Okay, well, I can put this succinctly, and I think that maybe this will come in handy for you all as you navigate this difficult political moment for our country and in your own households. Um, when I was identifying as a moderately conservative in economics and socially liberal, that's probably how I would have thought of myself as a very teenager and in my early 20s, very early 20s. Um, there are ideas that I had at the time. For example, I didn't agree with affirmative action. I thought it was unfair. Um, I now think that nothing could be in the world could be more fair than affirmative action. And what I try to impart upon people when they're looking at someone on the other side of the aisle as dumb or perhaps monstrous, this is barring hate, by the way. I never harbored any hate. I just had some ideas that I now find to be um, incorrect. But what changed was not wasn't me. I wasn't any less of a decent person at that time when I had a different idea. What changed was my information sources and my environment. And those two things, uh, sociologists will tell you, more than anything else, predict your beliefs, in, in particular your peer group. So most people who have very liberal views came by them the same way that most people who have very uh, conservative views did, which is through their family, through their place, through the information that they did or didn't have occasion to intersect with. We have a few uh, questions pre-submitted by the audience. We'll run through them quickly. With so much of the media trying to put pit rural and urban against each other, what has worked for you in trying to unite these two different worlds or at least help build a little empathy? From Michelle Lang. Thank you, Michelle. I think on that one, um, Often, you know, at the very beginning of this conversation, we were talking about, or, or I mentioned the various sorts of power structures or continuum in this country, whether that's race or gender or class. We often overlook within that package some, it's something that I think very much has a, um, a power structure about it, which is place. So where you co come from within the context of the greater Chicago area, that might mean a neighborhood or a town or whatever. Um, if you broaden out to the political unit of our entire nation, then we might ref we might think roughly of urban and rural as these two sort of geographic spaces and also two different lived experiences. And in general, while there are millions of people in poverty in cities, in general, economic tides are such that rural spaces have been at a disadvantage in a lot of ways for a long time. And so for that reason, I think that it, the most important piece right now is to humanize and tell store, true nuanced stories about the place that is rural America to um, hopefully encourage an understanding of that place and its diversity. It's not all white male Trump voting farmers. It's people of all colors, people of all views. Um, some of the most rabid progressive activists I know are like, LGBTQ identifying rural people, radicalized because they ha it was either leave their place or um, fight for progress to be welcome in the place that they so want to continue to reside because they loved growing up rural. So, it's, so for me, it's about humanizing a place that when we reduce it to a stereotype, we shut down conversation. A lot of that falls to the media to do that, but it also falls to us as consumers of media to figure out where to get that, right? Yes. So where should people be getting that information from? Oh, gosh. This is so tough because, um, you know, our industry is famously sort of um, uh, about 15 years ago, by most measures, collapsed in terms of its business model. And a lot of, I s provide that context because the answer should be, look to local reporting, look to small newspapers, look to journalists and storytellers, um, well, not just who are, you know, credential-carrying members of the press, but, you know, um, 
indigenous peoples bearing witness at Standing Rock through social media or, you know, look to look to voices that are on the ground in the rural space speaking for themselves or about their own community as reporters. And unfortunately, that is harder and harder to do at a moment when um, most of our access to news comes through. It's filtered through places that have very little understanding of those rural spaces. So I think, um, you know, but I will say that if, if something is going down in Iowa, at least look to the Des Moines Register rather than the New York Times to tell you about Iowa. God bless the New York Times, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Sarah, we're almost out of time here. But before we let you go, we have to present you with your medal. I'm pretty sure that you are the only winner of the Tribune Heartland Award whose book <laughs> has been called Heartland. <laughs> Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. I just, just one last thought. I found this a very spiritual book. You know, we think of it as economic and sociological, but it's really, in its way, it's spiritual. And I just wondered if you had any final spirit lifting words for us. <laughs> well, the, the reason that if, if you pick up on that, that, that comes from my family. That's a power unto um, a lot of people who um, don't have much agency otherwise, is their deepest inner reserves are what they can count on. And um, that's a fortune that I was born into and, uh, and I carry it with me. So I guess I would, um, you know, since, since we've been talking about our, our, our troubles as a society, encourage you to look for um, the, the goodness and the power in other people rather than um, the identity markers that might trigger your own biases along lines of class and, and other aspects of identity um, to, uh, to, to, to connect with one another as ultimately a shared society who is um, in spiritual and physical and economic terms all in it together. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks. <laughs>